So we're going to be talking about tissues. And basically, when we talked about cells, we talked about how different types of body cells are highly specialized. They also exhibit complementarity um, based on the type of task that they perform and also the way that those cells are um, structured. Well, we can take groups of cells that together are either similar in structure or similar in function and group them together. And these groups of cells would be called tissues. And so we see tissues throughout the body because tissues are going to um, group together to form organs. Okay, so if you think back um, that first topic that we talked about, that hierarchy of structural organization, um, this is following along with that hierarchy. So cells are going to um, come together to form tissues, tissues are going to come together to form organs, and then we know that organs come together to form an organ system for a specific function in our body. Um, there are four types of tissue in the human body, so it's just amazing to think that your, your entire body, we can trace it back to four primary tissue types. And so we have um, nervous tissue, which is going to be um, responsible mainly, like its primary function would be communication. We've got muscle tissue, which includes um, skeletal muscles, so it's responsible for movement of the um, skeletal system. We've got heart muscle and we've got smooth muscle, which lines um, hollow organs like your digestive tract and your stomach. Um, we have epithelial tissue, which is basically like covering and lining tissue, um, also forms the skin. And then connective tissue, which is basically there to um, protect. So bones are connective tissue and um, uh, uh, tissue like tendons and ligaments to help bind other structures together. So if we look at um, tissues, we can see that they're organized into organs, like the heart is an organ, and the liver is an organ, and the skin is an organ. Um, and typically what we see is that organs are going to contain all four tissue types. So within the heart, it's actually going to have all four of these tissue types um, contained within it. So we're going to go through each tissue type individually and talk about some um, details with each one. Epithelial tissue. So typically what we see with epithelial tissue is it's basically a sheet of cells that's either going to cover a body surface, so think about our skin, or it's going to line a body cavity. Um, so epithelial tissue is responsible for um, forming boundaries between different environments, whether it's external to internal, um, like our skin, or um, within body cavities in terms of... Um, um, forming a boundary between like the thoracic cavity um, and the areas around that. So there are two types of epithelium. We have either covering and lining epithelium, which is basically what we were just talking about. So this forms the outer layer of the skin. Um, it's going to line um, digestive, respiratory, urogenital systems. It's also going to cover the walls and the organs of the ventral body cavity. That was something that we talked about in the um, first topic um, with the serous membranes in the thoracic cavity and pericardial cavity and abdominal pelvic cavity. That's what that's talking about. Um, and then we have glandular um, epithelium, which is going to form glands in the body. Some functions of epithelial tissue, and you can read through these. Um, one of the primary functions is protection. So if you think about that with our skin, um, we also have these processes of basically absorption and secretion. Um, so we're able to absorb substances across epithelial tissue. We're also able to secrete substances that we don't want to keep. Um, and then also sensory receptors um, are part of epithelial tissue. <clears throat> Some characteristics of epithelial tissue. So epithelial tissue is arranged so that it has um, an apical surface and a basal surface. 
So we see this polarity, and basically that just means that there's some structural differences between the two. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit on the next slide. I've got that, um, I've got an image there. What we see with the apical surface, and the apical surface is going to be the surface. So let's say that I had, um, let's do stomach. So let's say that maybe here's our stomach. Okay, and then we're gonna go down. This is gonna be small intestines. Okay, but here's my stomach. And if we highlighted a particular area of that, let's say that here's our cells here, you know, facing the inside of the stomach. And then here's gonna be some cells on this side. So the, the surface of the epithelial cell that's facing the inside of the organ, that's facing to the interior, is gonna be the apical surface, okay? So this is gonna be the apical surface of the cell. And the part of the cell that's facing away from the interior of the organ is going to be the basal surface. So that's gonna be out here. That's gonna be this surface here, okay? Again, we'll highlight this on the next slide. What we tend to see with epithelial tissue is that those apical surfaces contain certain adaptations. Um, for instance, microvilla or cilia, um, which microvilla is also known as brush borders. And these um, little tiny projections help to increase surface area for processes of absorption or secretion. Okay, so that's one of the adaptations that we see in areas where absorption or secretion would be beneficial. So for instance, like digestive tract. Um, our digestive tract is responsible for absorbing all the nutrients that we eat. And so it would make sense that in that particular epithelial tissue of the digestive tract, um, we would see characteristics like microvilli. We also have cilia um, that are present on the apical surface of some epithelial tissue. And you can see that here, you can see these little cilia um, kind of sticking up. So this surface here is gonna be our apical surface. This surface down here would be the um, basal surface. Um, and cilia is there, these guys create movement, and so they're there to propel substances. So we would see cilia in epithelial tissue, for instance, of the respiratory tract um, to help propel um, foreign pathogens that we inhale in our air out of our respiratory tract so that they don't infect our lungs. So you see specific adaptations based on where that epithelial tissue is located. And that, um, again, always be thinking about that issue of, um, or that concept of complementarity, that's exactly what that is. The, the type of tissue and the adaptations that we see um, of that particular tissue makes sense based on specifically where that tissue is located. Um, and so next to the basilar surface, so we can kind of see here's our basilar surface here of those cells um, is the basal lamina. And basal lamina is basically this thin sheet. Um, it contains glycoproteins and collagen, um, which are proteins that help to give it structure. And so these cells are basically um, you know, contacting this thin sheet of proteins underneath that help provide some stability um, to the epithelial tissue. So here's um, what I was talking about here. Here's our epithelium. This surface, kind of the free surface that would open up to the inside of the um, organ or, or body cavity is going to be the apical surface. And that's going to be the free surface. And again, that's where we see um, like microvilli or cilia. Um, the um, kind of the base of the cell would be the basal surface. And so that's what we see here. This is kind of the base of the cell. And we are going to have epithelial tissue arranged as basically like a sheet of tissues. And the cell junctions that we typically see in epithelial tissue are going to be tight junctions and desmosomes. So if you think back when we talked about cell junctions, that should tell you um, what the functions of these cell junctions are. And then realizing that all the sheets of epithelium rest on 
um, this um, thin connective tissue underneath. So we have a sheet of basal lamina. We have a sheet of reticular lamina, which is going to be here. So basal lamina, here's our reticular lamina. And if we take both of those together, it's going to create this structure called a basement membrane. And so that's going to be the whole thing. And so basically, this is how epithelial tissue is arranged. Um, it's going to be a thin sheet of cells that's going to be um, sitting on top of a basement membrane, and that helps to give it structure. Um, and also, you know, a lot of a lot of times, epithelial tissue, we see it in areas of high abrasion. So think about your skin. Um, think about the inside of your mouth when you eat spicy Thai food. Um, so it's an areas that tend to be abraded and um, they those those thin sheets of cells need to be resistant to the shearing forces that they're put um, that are put against them so that's where this basement membrane comes comes in it's basically providing structure to those cells sitting on top of it um, another important thing about epithelial tissue is that it's avascular so what does avascular mean? So vascular means blood supply. And if it's avascular, it means it actually doesn't have its own blood supply, which is kind of interesting. So epithelial tissue does not have blood vessels going to it specifically. Um, the way that it gets blood, because all tissues need blood, right, in order to, um, in order to survive, blood is going to diffuse up from underlying surfaces. So if you look here, down underneath the epithelial tissue, it's basically resting on connective tissue, which is a different tissue type. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But connective tissue does have blood vessels. And so it's got blood vessels going all through it. So that blood is going to diffuse um, through the tissue and up and provide the epithelium with, with blood. Um, epithelial tissue is innervated. So what does innervated mean? It means that it has nerves going to it. And if anything has nerves, it means that now we have sensation and also possibly pain, right? So if something has a nerve going to it, we can feel it. Um, so we're aware of it. So epithelial tissue is innervated. Um, epithelial tissue also thank goodness, has a high regenerative capability. So it's able to regenerate, which is good because every time you eat hot Thai food and you burn off the inside of your mouth or you drink coffee that's too hot, um, it regenerates, it comes back. Or every time you, um, you know, cut your skin, um, it doesn't stay cut, you heal, right? And so that's the regenerative capabilities that we see in epithelial tissue. Um, so when we talk about epithelial tissue, all epithelial tissue is described by two names, okay? So the first describes the number of cell layers present. So um, it's either going to be simple or stratified, and we'll talk about that. Um, the second name describes the shape of the cells. So we're either going number of layers, and we're also describing it by the shape. So let's look at that. Here's our... Here's our number of layers, okay? So if we have simple epithelium, that means that that epithelium is one cell thick, okay? It's gonna be one cell layer. If we have stratified epithelium, it means that we have many cell layers, okay? Stratified is gonna be many layers. Sorry. Oh my gosh. Sorry, there is a spider on the floor. <laughs> okay, so um, simple is one cell. Stratified is going to be many cells. Now, here's an important thing. Sometimes what we see is that when we have stratified cells, the shape of our cells are going to change as we move through the layers. And so the basal surface or like the base surface cells will be different than the apical surface cells. This is an important detail. The 
type of epithelium is named for the cell shape of the apical layer. Okay? It doesn't matter what's down here at the basal surface. It only matters what this cell shape is. This, this one cell that's up here sitting at the apical surface. Okay? What's that cell shape? That's how this um, epithelium is going to be named. Okay? So that's an important detail. Um, so when we have simple epithelium, meaning one cell layer thick, we're going to basically see that in areas of absorption or secretion um, or filtration, basically where we need to have substances that are going to be able to cross through that cell. It's only one cell layer thick, and there's a reason for that. That doesn't really protect us from anything, does it? It's only one, one little cell layer thick. It doesn't offer much in the way of protection, but what it does offer us is the ability to like move substances across it really easily, like diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Um, the other type, so if we have stratified um, cells that are like all these different layers, basically that's going to be found in areas of abrasion. So your skin would be stratified epithelium because we're constantly hitting it on things and knocking off cells and um, we need that extra protection there. So it makes sense that we would find simple epithelium in some areas and stratified epithelium in other areas. Now, in terms of the shape of cells, we have three different choices of shapes of cells. So here's our, here's our choices. The first one is squamous, and these guys are like thin, flat cells. We have cuboidal cells, which are going to be like little cubes. They look like little boxes. And then we have columnar cells. So these guys are going to be tall, they're going to be kind of rectangular shaped, um, and they're kind of like columns. And so in order to name um, epithelium, it's kind of like going to a restaurant where you have to pick one choice from this menu or this part of the menu and one choice from this part of the menu. So when we talk about epithelium, we always are going to choose either um, simple or stratified. So one choice is going to be the number of layers, and then the second part of the name is going to be the shape. So it's either going to be simple squamous, simple cuboidal, simple columnar, or stratified squamous, stratified cuboidal, or stratified columnar. Okay, so all epithelium has two names. So I've included for you the specific type of epithelial tissue that you need to know. So let's just highlight this one. Here's our simple squamous epithelium. So we already know that the simple tells us that it's one cell layer thick. And the squamous tells us that it's going to be the little flattened um, thin cells. Okay? So one cell layer thick. So the whole reason for that is to allow substances to pass through it. So we're either looking at diffusion or filtration or secretion, that sort of thing. And that's exactly what we see. So the function of this type of epithelium is going to be, um, we'll see it in areas of diffusion, filtration. Um, this is kind of important. It's in sites where protection is not important. That little one layer of squamous cells doesn't give you any protection at all. So we're only going to see this in areas that um, really need to allow substances to pass in and out, not areas of protection like the skin. So here's your locations. And so, um, you know, I think what's important here is to realize the type of cell, what it looks like, what the function is, um, and also an example of a location of that tissue type. Okay. So there's simple squamous, here's simple cuboidal, okay? And again, it's simple, it's just that now we've got cube-shaped cube cells instead of squamous. So again, we're going to see this in areas of secretion and absorption. Um, this is most notable in the kidneys. Um, we've got simple columnar, which again, it's one cell layer thick, but now we're um, columnar, we're kind of those tall columns um, cells. Some of these guys are gonna have microvilli, um, which we know are important for um, increasing surface area for um, absorption. And so 
That's what we see here. Our function here is going to be absorption and secretion. Um, we see um, simple columnar cells or simple columnar epithelium lining the digestive tract, um, which is kind of a highlight of that tissue type. Um, pseudostratified columnar. And so what this means, pseudostratified is an, is an interesting um, type of tissue. And what we have with pseudostratified is it looks like it's stratified, but it's actually not. So here's here's what it is. We have a single layer of cells of differing heights. And what we end up having is let's say that this is our basal surface and here's our cells. And these are columnar, so these are going to be like, you know, rectangular shaped cells. And what we have here is we have nuclei of those cells that are at different heights. Okay, so they're not all lined up and it gives the impression that we've got different layers of cells when in fact we don't. And so that's what pseudostratified means. So here's some pseudostratified columnar. Um, and again, it's, it's basically one cell thick, even though it looks like it's more. So this is going to be in areas of secretion. Um, and so you'll see this like in the, um, in the trachea. Um, also to highlight too, some of this um, epithelium is going to contain cilia. And if you think before, um, what we talked about, cilia is going to be responsible for propulsion of substances. And so um, you'll see ciliated, pseudostratified columnar epithelium lining the trachea because that cilia will help to um, propel substances um, up the respiratory tract that we don't want to get down into our lungs. Okay, now we move into different tissue types. Here's stratified squamous. And so this is telling you here, our stratified is telling us that it's this is more than one layer thick. And so we know that when epithelium is stratified, it's going to be important for protection and um, protection from abrasion. And then squamous is going to be our little flat cells. And that's exactly what we see here. So here's an example of stratified squamous. Um, its function is protection because of stratification. And so what we're going to see is this in the epidermis. We're going to see this in areas that are subject to abrasion like the esophagus, the mouth, and the vagina. Um, so you'll see stratified squamous. In, in different locations in the body. Transitional epithelium. Um, this is a very specific type of um, epithelium where we have um, basal cells. So the part here that's along this um, basal surface are going to be more um, cubo cuboidal or columnar. And then um, the apical cells are going to be um, more um, squamous when this tissue stretched. So I always, I always describe this tissue to my students as spandex. Okay, so transitional epithelium is basically the spandex or of epithelium. Okay, this stuff is stretchy. And we see this in areas where we have to um, allow for stretch. So it all makes sense. This is located in your bladder. Okay, that's the primary um, organ where we see transitional epithelium because as your bladder fills with urine, it's going to stretch out and distend to accommodate that urine. So it's basically stretching out like spandex and just as the fabric kind of stretches out um, when you pull it, so does this, this transitional epithelium, those top cells kind of stretch out and they become more squamous-like because they kind of flatten out. That's what we see there. Okay, um, now we also talked about two types of epithelia. We talked about covering and lining epithelium, which is all the types of epithelium that we were just talking about. We also have glandular um, epithelium. And so these are basically epithelial cells that are responsible for making and secreting a substance, which we call a secretion, um, which is typically a water-based fluid with proteins. And so this can be either um, like hormones, this can be sweat, um, this can be mucus, 
all different examples of types of secretions that glands can secrete. Um, and glands can be either endocrine glands, which means internally secreting, or exocrine glands, which means um, externally secreting. So if we look at this, here's our endocrine glands. So endocrine glands, um, just, to, just in general, because we'll get more into endocrine system later, um, but what we have with endocrine glands is you form this gland, this kind of um, invagination here of the epithelium, and it's basically going to form um, a gland on the inside of the cell or inside of the tissue, and um, hormones are going to be secreted from that cell, from that um, organ, <laughs> into the bloodstream to travel to a distant target organ. Okay, so the whole thing with this, with endocrine glands, is that the gland doesn't have um, access to the external surface of the of the skin or the body cavity. So it's all internal, and the secretion is going to go straight from that um, gland into the bloodstream. And so that's why we call it endocrine gland, um, as opposed to exocrine glands. And what happens with exocrine glands is we have this invagination of the um, epithelial tissue, but we maintain this passageway from the gland. So here's our gland down here. We maintain kind of this open passageway from the gland to the you know, external surface of the body. And so as a result, exocrine glands are responsible for secreting their contents um, either onto body surfaces like um, sweat, or salivary glands secreting um, into our body cavities, like our oral cavities. Um, we have mucus glands that are going to secrete mucus at different areas through the body. So, um, but that's kind of the difference there. It secretes it um, either onto the surface of your body or into the body cavities, whereas endocrine glands secrete into the blood vessels. Okay, so our next tissue type. So epithelial tissue was our first tissue type. Connective tissue is our second tissue type. And we have four types of connective tissue. So we've got what we call connective tissue proper. We'll have cartilage that we'll talk about. We have bone, and then we have blood. So blood seems to be kind of the odd man out here. Doesn't seem to be similar to cartilage or bone or um, connective tissue proper, which is going to be tendons and ligaments and that kind of thing. So blood's kind of the, the odd man out. Um, you can read through functions of connective tissue. It's basically to bind and support. It's there for protection. Um, what's interesting here is that all connective tissue arises from the embryonic um, tissue mesenchyme. And so that's the reason why we can have blood be the same type of tissue as bone. It's all in the same category because it all came from uh, the same um, embryonic tissue of mesenchyme. So in terms of characteristics of connective tissue, we have all connective tissue consists of an extracellular matrix. Okay, and so extracellular matrix. And extracellular matrix is non-living and is going to include ground substance and fibers, okay? And so we're going to have different fiber types that we can choose from, and then we're going to have some different components of ground substance. But basically what this does is this creates a very strong connective tissue that's able to withstand trauma and abrasion, and if you think about what the function of these tissues are, um, it makes sense that they need to be really strong. So here's our different types. We have ground substance, which is basically going to fill the space of connective tissue between the cells. We have fibers that are going to be included, and we basically have a couple choices here. We have um, collagen fibers that are really, really tough. These are very tough protein. Elastin, which based on its name would um, 
point you in the direction of elasticity. So elastin fibers are capable of stretch um, and recoil, and so they provide some elastic component. Um, and then we also have a third type of fiber. So let's add reticular. fibers to this, and these are basically like a thin kind of mesh of fibers that help to provide more of like a structural framework for the cells to um, connect to. And so we've got three types of fibers there. Um, and then we've got connective tissue cells. And so these cells are actually responsible for the secretion of the ground substance in that particular type of connective tissue and also the type of fiber in that particular type of connective tissue. So we've got three types of connective tissue cells. We've got fibroblasts, we've got, which we're gonna see in connective tissue proper. We've got chondroblasts, which we're going to see in cartilage. And we've got osteoblast, which we're gonna see in bone. So um, chondro, anytime you see the word chondro, that's going to mean cartilage. So that should help you pair that up in your head. And then anytime you see osteo, that means bone. So that's going to help you pair that up too. Now, what you'll also find is these cell types have kind of two versions of each cell type. So um, the blast form of the cell, like fibroblast, is going to be the immature cell type. And that means that it's actually actively secreting the um, ground substance and the fibers. Okay, it, that's the immature form. Now the site form, so we can take each one of these cells like a fibroblast, once it becomes mature, it is now called a fibrocyte. And once that chondroblast becomes mature, it's going to be called a chondrocyte. And then same with osteoblast and osteocyte. So that site is going to be the mature um, form of that particular cell. Okay, Ground substance, like, like we said before, is basically in between the cells. Um, this is going to contain the fibers, so it's going to contain either the collagen elastin or reticular fibers. It's also going to um, contains some fluid. So this is where we see our interstitial fluid, um, which allows for diffusion between capillaries and the cells themselves. We're going to see cell adhesion proteins, um, which are going to be proteins embedded to the plasma membrane, and they help um, attach cells to one another. And then we're also going to find glycosaminoglycans, otherwise known as GAGs. And these are basically these large polysaccharides um, which are attached to proteoglycans, and these are responsible for holding onto water. So um, if we have increased content of glycosaminoglycans, we're going to have increased viscosity um, of that particular ground substance. So um, these offer some protection as well. Okay, here's our types of fibers again. We've got three versions of fibers. So collagen fibers are very tough and give that particular type of connective tissue um, a lot of strength. Um, we have elastin fibers, which are more elastic. So we're going to see those in the type of connective tissue that need elasticity. And then our third type are those reticular fibers, which are these little fine mesh of fibers that help to provide support um, for structures around them. Okay, and this is what I was talking about before. Each type of connective tissue has a resident cell type. So if we are looking at connective tissue proper, we have fibroblasts, which is the immature cell type and is actively secreting the ground substance and the fibers. Once it becomes mature, cells in connective tissue proper are going to become fibrocytes. That site part tells us it's a mature cell. In cartilage, we find a different resident cell type. If it's immature, it's going to be a chondroblast. Again, that chondra means cartilage. Once those cells become mature, they then become chondrocytes. 
And then in bone, the resident cell type is osteoblasts. Osteo means bone. And the osteoblasts are actively secreting ground substance and fibers. And once they become mature, they are going to become osteocytes. Okay, so it is specific for that, you know, individual type of connective tissue. So the immature blast cells, so whether it's a fibroblast or an osteoblast, are actively mitotic. They are actively um, replicating and they are actively secreting the ground substance and fibers specific for their type of connective tissue. Okay, they are busy cells. Now, once they're done, they are going to become the mature version of their cell. So they're going to become now the site part of their cell. So whether it's fibrocyte or osteocyte, um, but in a lot of cases, they can change back to a blast so that they can regenerate um, or create ground substance and fibers if they need to based on injury. Okay, so they can help you heal in that way. There are some other connective tissue cells that are kind of embedded within um, the ground substance, um, and we'll see these different cell types. Adipocytes um, are going to be another cell type that's located there, and these are basically just fat cells that help to store fat that we can use as ener um, energy. Um, we have white blood cells that are going to be um, located there for immune function and to respond to injury. We're going to have mast cells that are um, located within connective tissue as well, and these are there to help. Um, they tend to um, contain histamine, and so they help to initiate um, inflammatory responses against microorganisms. And then also macrophages are going to be um, embedded within um, this tissue to help ingest um, foreign material or bacteria. So like if you cut your skin, um, uh, macrophages are there to help protect you um, from any bacteria that might get in that open wound.